his book, The Gay Science, Nietzsche famously writes in a section called The Madman. Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God. As many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Has he got lost? asked one. Did he lose his way like a child? asked another. Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage, perhaps emigrated? Thus they yelled and laughed. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God, he cried. I will tell you, we have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. And then a bit later, I've come too early, the madman said. My time is not yet. This tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of men. The fact that Nietzsche is an atheist will come as a surprise to no one. He takes his atheism very seriously. In a book of about the same period, written just a year or so before, he writes, historical refutation as the definitive refutation. In former times, one sought to prove that there is no God. Today, one indicates how the belief that there is a God could arise and how this belief acquired its weight and importance. A counterproof that there is no God thereby comes superfluous. In former times, atheists did not know how to make a clean sweep. That's pretty definitive. And of course, the idea that one should explain belief in God, how such a belief should have arisen, rather than, as theologians have often tried to do, to justify or prove the existence of God, that of course is perfectly in line with Nietzsche's general attitude towards psychology and the idea of explaining philosophical ideas rather than justifying them. But I think it's very important not to take Nietzsche's attack on God, or his thesis famously stated as, God is dead, as simply a kind of theological or anti-theological slogan. Rather, it has profound implications, as Nietzsche indicates here, and it's not just about theology, it's not just about religion at all. For example, for a long time, arguably since the Old Testament, morality has been thought to rest on a foundation with God as that foundation. It's, as, Ivan, as Ivan Karamazov says, if there is no God, everything is permitted. The idea being that it is God who provides us with the rules. It is God who sanctions the rules. It is for God's sake, or out of fear of punishment by God, that we obey the rules. The idea is that without God, there would be no morality and no reason for being moral. Even someone like Immanuel Kant, who argues, as I suggested in another lecture, that morality should be considered as a matter of reason, ultimately wants to say that morality and religion are intimately tied together, as he puts it. Belief in God is a postulate, a kind of corollary, a necessary entailment of belief in morality. So, if we abandon our belief in God, if we no longer believe what we once believed, what we still say we believe, and believe it in our hearts, not just in terms of some routine slogans. Somebody asks you, do you believe in God? You say, yes. That's not the point. But you look around and see, do people really believe in this? And the answer, Nietzsche says, is no. But if that's true, then we should expect that they're quickly going to lose their faith in morality as well, and he predicts a fairly horrendous 20th century in which the belief in God and the belief in morality have disintegrated. But it goes deeper than that. There's a sense in which belief in God lies at the very heart of our thinking, I've sometimes thought how much of philosophy in the last 2,000 years really is the product of theology, thinking about God as, in some sense, the foundation, the unity of all things, the creator, and we're all creations. And Nietzsche sees that this belief, this idea of there being a unity, a substance, an underlying foundation, while it's present in earlier Greek philosophy, 
nevertheless is fundamental and absolutely pervasive in Christian thinking, and not just in Christian thinking. Because what we find is that, for example, our grammar reflects a kind of syntax, subject, object, something as the base, something else as the property, which Nietzsche says is very much at the basis of religion and at the basis of metaphysics and at the basis of a good many of our beliefs. One could talk about other religions here too, of course. In ancient Hinduism, the notion of Brahman, the one unity, the real substance of which everything else is just a manifestation, comes to mind. But the general idea, the general idea is that belief in God is not just about religion. It's not just about theology. Belief in God really structures the way we think about the world. And as we'll see in a later lecture, such notions as the notion of truth, quite the contrary of being ultimately a scientific notion, ultimately has to be traced back to such theological origins. Nietzsche says in one of his most telling comments that we shall not be rid of God until we get rid of grammar. The idea is that God is so basic to our thinking that there's a sense in which God, like thinking, whether or not you're a theist or an atheist, is going to permeate everything that you think. And much of what Nietzsche wants to do is to somehow change that perspective. Finally, one can point out that for Nietzsche, God organizes society. This is obviously true in the Catholic Church, and for many, many centuries, of course, there was no real distinction between secular power and religious authority. But even though with the Reformation, with the Enlightenment, with modern political thinking, we've gotten away from that particular wedding, there is still a sense in which we think about society, we think about politics, in the same kind of hierarchical terms with someone of absolute authority at the top that was so obvious and straightforward in the Catholic Church. And what Nietzsche wants to say as well is that if there's a new politics, and as I said, Nietzsche is not particularly a political thinker, but if there's a new politics, it too has to get rid of the image of the political body on the model of Christianity. Besides God being the basis for the organization of society, I think it's fair to say that God is the basis for a lot of the organization of Nietzsche's thought. Although Nietzsche is probably not so well known as a religious thinker, as um, a kind of quasi-political one or um, a cultural rabble-rouser, nevertheless, I think it's quite reasonable to say that he is a religious thinker. He's concerned, and this is evident in the passage Bob read, with the fact that the society he lives in has become largely a secular society. It hasn't come to grips with that. In fact, many of the people who are contributing the most to its secular way of looking at the world aren't really aware of what, what they've left out of the story, um, any kind of mythic basis for reality. And in his talk about Christianity, I think Nietzsche is very often very consciously attempting to suggest the need for a new myth. When he says that God is dead, He's not simply saying that people no longer believe in God, something that many people already know, despite what the madman says. Instead, he's pointing out that there's a complete absence of a foundational myth. And one of the many strategic ways in which Nietzsche pursues this line of thought is to suggest that, after all, we do need a new myth. And he draws attention to this by use, utilizing some of the phraseology that's well known from his own tradition. He quotes or paraphrases scripture in many a, many, many a passage. For example, in the madman discussion, the madman at one point says, um, they have done it themselves, and yet they know not what they do. Anyone familiar with the New Testament will probably recognize that as not much of a change even in wording from what Christ says on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What I'm going to draw attention to for a minute is the way in which Nietzsche also utilizes a lot of phrases from um, a more recent religious thinker, Martin Luther, um, the central figure in his own immediate background, um, because I think a lot of those images are images that are very much misunderstood in Nietzsche 
and most people reading them don't recognize that there's a kind of religious base and that Nietzsche's using these to call attention to the need to develop a, a new kind of basis for answering spiritual questions. If not the Christian God, then at least something that serves much the same purpose. One of the most well-known uh, phrases in Nietzsche is his idea of philosophizing with a hammer. And certainly this connotes a lot of violence. What I think escapes notice oftentimes is the fact that this was a, a particular line from actually the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible that Luther had particular fondness for and dis discussed at great length. Um, the line in question is from Jeremiah, my word is a hammer which breaks the rock in pieces. And one of Luther's comments about it is, God wounds in order to heal. Now, why do I think that this is, um, importantly, in the background of what Nietzsche has to say? One of his uh, ways of parsing the whole notion of a hammer is to talk about how the hammer actually is used to, as he puts it, sound out idols, to see when idols have become hollow. And that's precisely what he wants to do with the Christian God. In this, he's following um, a tradition that also, besides the ones that Bob referred to in the last lecture, follows the thought of Ludwig Feuerbach. Feuerbach was famous for suggesting that humanity was not the creation of God. By contrast, God created, or humanity created God. And one of the unfortunate uh, side effects of this was that the more humanity developed its religious thought about God, the more of its own po positive powers, its positive virtues, it relegated to God, thereby diminishing humanity's sense of self and awareness of its own powers. So rather than say that um, one did something out of one's own virtue, the tendency was to attribute this to God. God provided grace. Anything negative that happened tend to be human responsibility, but anything virtuous couldn't really be taken as part of oneself. So what Nietzsche sees as a positive potential of sounding out the most famous idol, namely the idol of the Christian God, is for us to realize, after all, that the whole story of the Christian God was a human invention. And in fact, its very greatness, its power to synthesize society for so long, was a human production. If we could achieve that kind of great basis for thought at one point, surely we have the resources to come up with an alternative myth. But back to the hammer. Another feature of this hammer image, besides sounding out idols to see which are hollow, is actually to take the hammer and smash those idols that don't end up um, really providing anything useful to humanity anymore. This sort of violent image is one that comes directly from both um, the Old Testament and Luther's gloss on it. The idea that there's an attempt to create, um, but to create only by means of destroying. And that's something that Nietzsche wants to suggest that humanity needs to do. So again, there's a sense of a role that used to be played by God, God wounding in order to heal, is now something that we, in the aftermath of the death of God, might take seriously um, in doing ourselves. What we ought to do is try to recreate, but we can only do that first by destroying. Another frequently mentioned image in Nietzsche that I think um, stems in many ways from Luther is the notion of masks. Bob's already drawn attention to Nietzsche's own mask, that of the mustache, but Nietzsche frequently talks about how so much of perceived human behavior really masks the actual motive. And again, I think there's a kind of reference to Luther's discussion of God wearing many masks. We can't always see God's motives, instead we see masks of God. If Nietzsche wants to put humanity in the place formerly occupied by humanity's own invention, namely God, what he wants to do is draw attention to the fact that we ourselves and our own motives are filled with masks. And again, it's kind of putting humanity in the place, in the place of the object of most interest and eliminating God from that position, since practically we've already done that. One of Nietzsche's uh, particular emphases throughout his philosophy that we'll be talking about a lot in this series is his talk of affirmation, of saying yes to life, uh, to one's own life specifically. And again, I think that there's a kind of uh, reference back to Luther using this kind of terminology. 
For example, Luther discussing the way in which God infuses grace into the soul um, involves a rather elaborate scenario in which the pride of the sinner, first of all, has to be crushed, indeed, by a hammer um, in some locutions, and after that pride is crushed, despair will descend. At this moment of despair, the sinner is finally open for God's grace to come in. And one of Luther's own lines about this is, deeper than no, and above it, the deep mysterious yes. Nietzsche's many oppositions of yes saying to life and saying no, I think draws again very directly from this image, that what he wants to put in place of a kind of negative orientation that he himself thinks is a necessary stage to pass through is ultimately to look for this position from which we can say yes to life, to appreciate it fully. And a final Lutheran image, or image that precedes Luther, but that Luther draws a lot of attention to, is the idea of overflow. Nietzsche is often talking about the person that's really full of vitality and life, and the desirability of living in such a way that one's own um, spirit flows over. It becomes evident in everything that one does. The sense of affirmation about life is not something that just is content to sit with itself, but involves a lot of interaction. Health becomes dynamic. And this is precisely the sort of thing that Nietzsche um, sees already in Luther when he talks about the person who really has Christian faith performing good works out of a kind of overflow. So filled with God's grace, um, this grace overflows in good works. Nietzsche wants to borrow that image, but secularize it and say, indeed, it isn't God's grace, but our own power that overflows. Certainly, he does have many harsh things to say about Christianity, and we'll discuss them more. Already, we've alluded to some of them. He thinks too many people are mindlessly conformist in external observance without really thinking through exactly what their true motives actually are. And he's very much on the alert for what he sees as a kind of self-righteous hypocrisy that masks itself in Christian locutions. Um, he himself uses masks of Christian locutions, but tries not to be so hypocritical about them. But even so, he thinks that Christianity has served a really important historical function for people. And I think it's very interesting that in the passage about the madman, it's not people who believe in God that the madman, ass madman assaults. The madman assaults those people who think they can just eliminate the need that God once filled in society for something like God, who think that by eliminate, by focusing all attention on science, they can simply eliminate myth, um, ignore the needs of humanity that have led humanity up to this point. Nietzsche thinks that's very ungrateful, but the way in which we should gr show our greatest gratitude to this kind of thought of humanity is to think beyond it. There's a sense, of course, in which Nietzsche rejects Christianity wholesale, and two concepts in particular that Nietzsche says he just wants to get rid of. And those are the concepts of guilt and sin. Now, guilt, of course, has taken quite a beating since Nietzsche. Freud got a hold of it and declared it, if not always, certainly often, a neurotic symptom, that guilt is something pathological. But for Nietzsche, it's even worse. Guilt is metaphysical. So is sin. So, by the way, is the concept of evil which ties them together. Which is to say, it's not just a function of human projection, and it's not just a function of human valuation, but as it's perceived, guilt and sin are both something else. They're essential features of the world. Guilt in particular is metaphysical in the fact that it is a property or an acquired property of the soul. One of my Catholic friends, as a young girl, was told in school that she had to paint a picture of her soul. And the picture of the soul consisted of taking a black crayon and making appropriate smudges which represented her sins. The notion of guilt is a metaphysical blemish. And of course, together with the doctrine of original sin, what it says is we all have blemished souls. Now Nietzsche doesn't believe in that kind of a soul although he's certainly not soulless, but he certainly wants to say that picture of the basic blemish, that idea that somehow we are fallen, the very idea that we are initially, from the outset, 
somehow failed or flawed creatures, is something we should not accept. Now that's not to say that Nietzsche thinks we're perfect, quite the opposite. He is all in favor of making more of ourselves the need to struggle to become who we are. But nevertheless, this idea of a metaphysical anger, anchor which prevents that, the idea that we are essentially guilty in some fundamental way, is something he utterly rejects. And in line with Nietzsche's general attitude towards life, one can anticipate he has the same attitude towards sin. In fact, when you think about sin in the Christian tradition, something very odd should strike you. That the most serious crimes, murder, theft, treachery, rape, those aren't the things that are talked about the most. Partly, of course, because the wrongness of them is taken for granted. But if you think, for example, of the list of so-called seven deadly sins, I think you get a real insight into what's going on here. In fact, these are human foibles. They are features of the human circus. They are things that make us amusing, things that make us sometimes silly. But nevertheless, it's what defines many of our characters. Run down the list. Lust. I mean, there's something very strange about the attack on lust in, for example, St. Paul. It's not as if lust is something to be overcome. And Nietzsche's Dionysian temperament says quite clearly, lust is something to be enjoyed, but of course in a way that is appropriate and suitable. Or gluttony. Now, I don't know what your attitude towards food is, but drawing again from Feuerbach, we might say that gluttony is something that's essentially human. A certain amount of discipline, self-control, politeness if you like, is certainly necessary, but nevertheless, Gluttony isn't a sin, much less a deadly sin. Gluttony is just a feature of being human. Greed. Well, perhaps that's more exaggerated in the 20th century than it was before the sort of outset of global capitalism. But nevertheless, greed has always been with us. And there's a sense in which greed is not necessarily evil. To be sure, sometimes it causes great harm. But in most people, greed is just it's one of those little things about them, something to joke about, something to criticize them about, something to gossip about. But again, it's part of the human circus. Anger, can you imagine a world without anger? Aristotle, I think very insightful on these matters, talks about anger not as a sin, but quite to the contrary. Anger is something which the good person will naturally feel in the right kind of circumstances. Not to get angry in the appropriate circumstances, to the appropriate degree, at the appropriate person, he says, is to be a fool. And so to think of anger as a sin right away makes you think something very deep and something very different from what is being pronounced here is actually going on. Envy? Well, I hate to say it, but envy is a basic human emotion. And for someone who sees human behavior as really basically competitive, Envy, quite naturally, is going to be an inevitable outcome. And Nietzsche talks at great length, of course, about Envy's twin sister, and that is resentment, which he says explains an awful lot about human behavior and Judeo-Christian morality in particular. Then there's pride. What's so bad about pride? Again, let me refer back to Aristotle. What Aristotle points out is that pride is nothing but what we would call in rather Californiaish terms, self-esteem, thinking well of oneself, recognizing one's accomplishments and exploits. But of course, in Christian theology, pride is considered a sin. And in fact, on some of the lists, pride is the number one sin because it's paying attention to yourself instead of to God. And finally, the odd sin of the seven, sloth. But is sloth really a sin? I mean, should you be sent to prison for it? Should be, you be damned for it? The truth is that human laziness is another butt of jokes, gossip. It may not be a recipe for success in this rather hurly-burly, ambitious world. But nevertheless, I think most of us could use a good dose of sloth in our lives. And the truth is, to talk about these as sins, to talk about these as metaphysical failures in some sort, 
is really to say something outrageous. And what Nietzsche wants to do in his war on guilt and sin is to say, in effect, look, guilt as it's conceived, not as a matter of responsibility and not as simply a matter of shame, which is a different matter too, but guilt as it's conceived, as a kind of embarrassment before God, as something that's essentially flawed about you, is something that must be overcome and rejected. And the notion of sin or evil as a kind of metaphysical writ rather than simply part of the human circus, part of human behavior, is something we have to overcome too. Now, just to anticipate, that's not to say that Nietzsche doesn't recognize the existence of profound evil in the sense that we would all accept. What he rejects and what he attacks is the notion of evil as it's attached to metaphysics, as it's attached to theology, as a set of absolute values. And in some of his most challenging statements, what he says is, in effect, that insofar as one is interested in, for example, the preservation and happiness of the human race, it has been more advanced at some points in history by profound evil than it has been by anything else. And of course, he has some controversial examples. He uses Caesar, Napoleon. I am sure if he had lived to be uh, much older, he would not have used Hitler. Although one can even argue there to be very polemical that much of the morality of the late 20th century has in fact been defined by the Holocaust. And we would not now have war crimes tribunals for crimes against humanity if it weren't for that horrible occasion in human history. So the basic idea is to take in the big picture, to ask what human beings are really like, whether human beings really need this religious foundation and this kind of absolutism in their morals. And Nietzsche's answer is a very general, strong no. In general, I think that one way w you could describe Nietzsche's attack on Christianity is that what he wants to do is return us to innocence. In fact, he talks about the innocence of the senses, um, the idea of nature as something that he hopes someday we'll again be able to see innocently, and the idea that it's basic instincts that are attacked in listing the various um, actions or attitudes um, that fall into the categories of the seven deadly sins, all of those, I think, Nietzsche would say, indicate that we're, we're really not innocent about ourselves any longer. You might say that his overall spiritual goal is to return us to a kind of self-esteem, a kind of self-esteem that's lost by when humanity has put all of its own virtues into a conception of God, a conception of God that sees all and mostly notes faults in humanity. But one other feature of this I think is important as well and very timely for Nietzsche. Nietzsche is writing after people have, in a sense, come to grips with the idea that the Earth is no longer the center of the universe. It's not even the center of the solar system. In fact, it's a pretty undistinguished planet, and our sun is a fairly undistinguished sun. In a sense, we've lost all moorings that an earlier um, tradition in the West, a tradition that was infused with the notion of the human place in the scheme of things and God having made humanity at a certain pinnacle, all that has been lost as science has developed more and more understanding of our natural place in the scheme of things. If you couple that with the loss of God, the loss of self-esteem as having this premier place in nature, Nietzsche thinks that it's absolutely e essential for humanity to s gain some kind of sense of its own importance. Thus, what he calls for is a spirituality of this world that recognizes our own virtues as virtues and recognizes the world we live in as beautiful. Thank you.